I'd like to invite all of you who are at uh, Northwestern College, as well as those of us here tonight, to bow now in prayer. Gracious Father, the cross of Christ, among all of its infinite riches, delivers two powerful messages to us. One is that I am a great sinner, and the other is that Christ is a great Savior. And unless we hear both of those messages with the devastation and the exaltation that they give, we will not grasp the preciousness of grace. In tonight's text, this morning's text, is about grace being transmitted through gifts for the good of the church. And so I pray for grace to come on these services in power. And that in the ministry fair there would be abundant grace. That in the conversations in lobby and pew there would be abundant grace. That in cars on the way home there would be great grace. Lord, make us a people who love to savor the grace that was bought for us at the cost of the Son of God's life. Help me now, I pray, to be faithful to your word and to open it in a way that would magnify grace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So we're going to move now beyond verse 3 where we have been for several weeks, to the comparison that Paul draws between the church and the human body. As the body has many parts, he says, but nevertheless is one body, hands, feet, ears, eyes, one body. So the church has many members, but is one interconnected organism. So let's read verses 4 through 6 again. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Now let me pause here before I read the next verse because I want to point out that the punctuation that you find in your Bible is the best call that translators can make because almost all the most original manuscripts of Greek didn't have punctuation. So where one sentence began and another stopped is a best call from context, not periods. I'm personally not real happy with this period here. Um, but I'm not going to bother you with that. I just want to invite you to consider the possibility that you perhaps should not pause at the end of that verse, but just keep right on going and think of them very closely connected. So back up, pick it up a little bit. Verse 5, So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy, in proportion to our faith. I'm going to stop there. And what I want to do is build a bridge into that text by giving the fourth answer to the question that I raised two weeks ago. So let me remind you of the question and the three answers we've already seen very briefly and then give you the, the fourth answer which builds the bridge then and becomes the message for this session together. Verse 3 was Paul's summons to us 
Let's just read it. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So I asked, why, Paul, do you make the God-assigned measure of faith the standard by which we should assess ourselves? Answer number one. Because the unique nature of faith deflects glory from me to God. Faith looks away from itself to the infinite value of Jesus and is satisfied with what it sees in Him and experiences from Him. And therefore, faith becomes the proper defining of the human being created to do that and my value as a person consists in my valuing Jesus. Or to be really precise, it consists in my valuing Jesus or my potential to value Jesus. Answer number two. Faith was made the standard by which I assess myself because faith is a gift from God and therefore you can't boast in a gift and to assess yourself by something that's a gift to you will cause boasting to cease and give all glory to God. Third, the third reason that Paul makes faith the standard by which we assess ourselves was that faith is given in varying proportions to the people in the church so that the resulting fellowship becomes a kind of interconnected, mutually serving body that is more difficult, more beautiful, and more Christ-honoring than if everybody had exactly the same degree of faith and maturity. Those were the three answers so far. And now, number four. It goes like this. Paul makes faith the, the standard of how we assess ourselves because faith is the root of all spiritual gifts. And faith is the trait of every spiritual gift that turns natural abilities into spiritual gifts. And therefore, faith is the criteria, criterion of spiritual gifts such that however great or small they are, they are a tribute to God and not to ourselves. Now, I've got to unpack that. That's all that the sermon tonight is, is to unpack answer number four. So let me explain it as best I can and then give you three places in the text where I see it. I, I didn't come up with my points and then go to the text. I've been laboring over this text for many weeks, and as it simmers in my brain, points emerge. So this fourth point comes out of something, but I want to explain the point, then go and see it in the text text. So what I mean by the root, faith is the root of all spiritual gifts, is that faith looks away from my natural resources, my abilities to preach, teach, or anything else, looks away from me to the infinite resources of grace and leans on that embraces that, holds to that, trusts in that for the exercise of whatever spiritual gift I think I have. And thus, faith becomes the instrument by which I channel grace from God to you. Faith is what lays hold on grace and brings it into my heart and puts it out through word. That's faith that does that. So it's the root of spiritual gifts. And what I mean by calling faith the trait of spiritual gifts that make the difference between them being natural abilities and spiritual gifts 
is that you can have all kinds of natural abilities in teaching, for example, and not have the spiritual gift of teaching. We'll come back to that shortly. The trait that makes the difference is, are you, by faith, leaning on supernatural grace to flow through you in the exercise of this thing you call your natural gift. And if you do lay hold on God and His grace to flow through you to bring blessing and spiritual lift and power and virtue and purity and all kinds of things to people, then your natural ability may become a spiritual gift. So, Faith is the root of all spiritual gifts in that it it draws up grace from the river of His infinite resources, and faith is the trait that makes the difference between whether you're just exercising a natural ability in what you do for people or whether you are actually transmitting grace to them through faith. Here's the way Peter puts it. Let's reach outside the text to make sure we see a very, very foundational text on spiritual gifts. 1 Peter 4.10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Gifts are the stewarding of grace. Gifts gifts are the transmitting of grace. And if you ask, how do you do that? My answer is faith. You look away from yourself. You despair of this spectacular ability that you have. You despair of it. It cannot save anyone. It cannot sanctify anyone. Only God can by grace. And so all these wonderfully intellectually gifted people despair of their giftedness. And they go to grace. And they plead, 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 oh God, don't leave me to my own skill. It will just impress people. And that accomplishes nothing of any spiritual value at all. I'll give you an example of teaching just a little further. There is a, a ability to teach that many people have who are not Christians. And what I mean by an ability or a gift, it comes from God. I mean, this is God's doing. God gifts Everybody with skills, believer or unbeliever. And a gift to teach would mean that people are always leaning toward you when they want something explained clearly and helpfully so that you come away from their explanation really helped. I mean, the rubber met the road, fuzziness got cleared up, you knew how to apply. I mean, this really helped me. Everybody knows that there are secular people who are In fact, we pay them lots of money to come into our companies and do that for us. That's not a spiritual gift. To stick one of those people with a Sunday school class might illumine facts, but any spiritual benefit that happened would be in spite, not because of the spiritual gift, in spite of the absence of it. What makes that person have a spiritual gift of teaching is that when they get saved, God grants them a proportion of faith, a measure of faith. And by faith, they despair of their natural giftedness, knowing that they've leaned on it heavily a long time and that they must not lean on it anymore as the decisive thing in their ministry. They must now lean on God, lean on grace, lean on prayer, lean on mercy, and they cry out, and God makes that faith 
the channel through which spiritual reality, spiritual supernatural power flows or not. And it's no guarantee that it's always flowing. I do not regard any of the spiritual gifts as static. Like, I've got it, it always works. There will be seasons in my life when the power is flowing unusually and other seasons, services, when it seems like, what? Where did he go? I don't assume any past guarantees fruitfulness in the future. Day by day, we lean on the living God to flow. And he's free. He can come and go as he pleases. He owes me not one blessing, not one. Mercy all. So that's my explanation of the point of faith is the root of spiritual gifts, drawing up grace, and faith is the trait of spiritual gifts, distinguishing natural abilities from spiritual gifts. Now, let's go to the text and see where did you get this. I have three observations to point out in the text. The first one comes from verse 6. In case you wonder, now we, there's going to be some things here that you don't address, and you're already in verse 6. Um, don't worry. We'll be in verses 1 to 8 for quite a while. And we'll be back just kind of moving around in here, picking up the things we've left out. And it's wonderful, David, how the Lord has timed. I'm talking to David Livingston, how the Lord has timed next Sunday's message for the small group kickoff. Just amazing. So, verse 6, beginning of the verse, having gifts that differ according to the grace of given to us. Gifts differ in accordance with graces that are given to us. Different kinds and degrees of grace flow through different kinds of gift. Gifts are the transmission of Grace. Now, you can see it in more clearly if I use some Greek on you. And I'm going to risk using a little Greek on you because you all know these words because some of you name your kids this, and others of you know the word charismatic. Anybody not know the word charismatic? Okay, that's a Greek word. It's in this text. It says, having gifts, charismata. Everybody knows that word. That's a Greek word, and you know it. Having charismata, gifts that differ according to the Karin or Karis. A bunch of women named Karis. It's a beautiful name. If I had ten daughters, one of them would be named Karis. Because there's so many good names I'd like to use for daughters. I like Talitha especially. But now notice having charismata that differ according to the charis. Now you can see it. Even if you don't know Greek, you can see it. You can hear it. Charismata charis. Charismata charis. Charismata charis. This is all these things called gifts are is the expression of, the embodiment of, the extension of, the use of God's grace flowing down and being bent out horizontally to people so that they get grace through us. That's what the church is for. Spread the grace. Pray it down on your unique configuration of life and personality. Start pouring it out, and guess what that poured out form is called? Your gift. You don't have to spend a lot of energy saying, oh, I gotta take an inventory here, and figure out which gift I have. What you gotta do is start loving people. That's all you got to do. Start loving people like crazy, finding out every way possible to make grace fall on people. And guess what? You'll be good at some things, and they'll thank you for them. You'll be bad at other things, and they won't call you back. <laughs> and you just learn kind of the process of elimination. All right, I'm not very good at that. But this person 
called me and said, thank you for, and I said, oh, I'll, I'll do that again, which means we need to respond. We need to, to help each other recognize where we're getting help from each other. So the words themselves are right there making clear that grace, and all I'm adding, that grace is, is expressed through gifts, and all I'm adding is, though it's not said in that verse, it is later, faith is what lays hold on the grace and flows through the gift. Uh, You can turn there if you want. I'm going to read verses 11 and 12 of chapter 1 just to show you how Paul talks like this. He says to the church, I long to see you that I may impart to you or share with you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. And then he breaks off and says, that is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. There it is. It's, it's Paul illustrating in his own longings what I'm trying to say, that faith is the root of spiritual gifts. He says, I, I really want to show up there in Rome and use a spiritual gift and extend it out to you. And what I mean is, I want faith to flow like this between us so that we both get strong from being around each other. Oh, that we would have a church like that. That our faith gets stronger because we're around each other. That's what it's for. We shouldn't, we shouldn't walk away from each other depleted. We should walk away from each other mutually strengthened. And I know that there are depleters in the world. God designed it that way. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15, last Sunday's message. I won't go into it again. So, faith is the root and faith is the trait, I think, is clear from those Text, but let me step back and say Romans 1 to 5. By faith, we reach out and lay hold on the righteousness of Christ for justification. Verses, I mean, chapters 6 to 8, faith reaches out and lays hold on the power of Christ for sanctification. And I'm adding to that not just justifying grace and sanctifying grace, but now grace for gifts. And it's all the same answer. How do you get justification? How do you get sanctification? How do you get gifts? Answer, trust Him. Believe in Him. Bank on Him. Look away from yourself to the resources of grace in all three ways and receive and rest in Him. Second observation from the text. The first one was from the first part of verse 6. And now we turn back up to the beginning of verse 3. Strange, but you'll see why. Verse 3 begins, For by the grace given to me, I say to every one among you. Now compare that to verse 6. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. According to the grace given to us parallels by the grace given to me. What would you draw from that? Here's what I draw. Paul has the gift of apostleship. He calls it that. I mean, he says he has it. He says he has it by grace. Chapter 1, verse 5. That means he has tremendous authority in the church. What apostles did was to teach authoritatively and provide a foundation, and everything we do is built on that. We don't expand that foundation of apostolic teaching. We understand it, and we apply it. They have foundation. We have application. That's our job. I do not add to what the apostles taught. I try to just extend and preach and teach and apply what the apostles taught. That's a huge difference between that gift and all the other gifts, which is why I don't think anybody has that gift today. Nevertheless, in spite of the spectacular nature of that gift, to be the Scripture 
writing, authoritative emissary of Jesus Christ, Paul says at the beginning of verse 3, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you. In other words, the thing that unites me to you in your giftedness, he says, and my giftedness is that I lean totally on grace for every sentence I write in this book of Romans. Every word I speak, I speak by grace. And thus what he's doing in verse 3 is modeling for us what he's about to teach. He's not pulling rank on them and saying, now you all be aware here that I have this unique thing called apostleship. He's saying, by the grace of God, I say, and then he says. And that's the way we should do our ministry, by the grace of God. He does it by the grace of God. We do it by the grace of God. And all I'm adding to that is saying, faith is what appropriates that grace. Now, one more observation, and it's the one that makes faith explicit. I've been laying it on by inference, the other two texts, but this one in verse 6 makes it explicit. So let's read verse 6 again. This is number 3, observation number 3, and the last one. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith. And there it is, explicit and clear. I think that could be said over every gift. If giving in proportion to your faith. If teaching in proportion to your faith. I don't think there's anything unique about prophecy that makes it be in proportion to your faith, but the others are out of proportion to your faith. Or somehow get connected another way. They really don't have anything to do with faith. He just begins that way. In fact, I think I'll be able to show that as we move through this list in coming weeks. So, what he's saying here is there is a proportion of faith that God assigns. Remember that from verse 3? Maybe we better get that in front of us. Back to verse 3. Think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith. Sound like proportion of faith? Very does. It does sound like it. It is the same in my judgment. Those are the same reality. The measure of faith that God has assigned in verse 3 is the same as in proportion to your faith in verse 6. So we all have different measures of faith, and we are to exercise our gifts accordingly. What's he saying? What's the point of that? You Just take prophecy. We'll come back and talk about what that is later. But prophecy is typical gift. Use the gift of prophecy in proportion to your faith. What that means? It means don't fake it. Oh, how easy it is to learn to perform the gifts. And on any given instance where you've been good at it for a long time and nothing is there spiritually this time, you just fake it. Which cannot be said to be in proportion to the faith that is drawing down grace for this moment exercise. Don't fake it. Let me try to give you some examples of how I think this works. I don't want us to play games at Bethlehem. I don't want us to be hypocrites at Bethlehem. I want us to be real. This is, this is a summons of Paul. I mean, does the connection between the wording of verse 6 in proportion to your faith and according to the measure of the faith that God supplies. Does that connection mean, as I think it does, that verse 6 is really making the same pride point 
as verse 3, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Think in proportion to the faith God has assigned to you. And down here, it's use your gift in proportion to your faith. That is, don't fake gifts to get a proper approval from other people. Don't let this ego thing take over in the use of your gifts. Now, let me give you some illustrations of the positive meaning this would have. I thought of about six. They're just sentences. So here's my question. Now, practically, Piper, suppose I have the gift of whatever. Let's just stay with the word gifts here. There's a lot of different kinds of word gifts. How does rising faith affect the way you do your gift? That's my question, because that's what it seems to be saying. So here's my answer. As your faith increases, the clarity of your vision of Christ increases. So, using your gift in proportion to a rising clarity of Christ would be that you share that clarity with others, that your gift becomes more useful in the clarity with which it brings people into connection with Jesus. I mean, there are times when, you know this, my head is more muddled than at other times as a preacher, and therefore the muddle gets shared all around. And other times it seems so clear. Why is that? Well, you, maybe I didn't do my homework, or maybe God just in proportion that morning has not brought the clarity that I had hoped for. And I can only function with whatever measure I have. Another example. As your faith increases, you're treasuring. I'm just taking the meaning of faith for these examples. The treasuring of Christ's worth increases in your heart so that the use of your gifts is, is performed with more passion because he is seen in your heart with greater preciousness of his worth. I mean, if your faith is increasing, his worth is increasing in your eyes, and therefore the passion is rising, and when you bend that outward to others, your gift is performed with more passion, which means having just experienced that last week, you can fake it this week. That's not hard to do. And he says, don't do that. Do not do that. In proportion to your faith. Here's a third example. As your faith increases, you will trust more fully in his promises for help, and therefore the use of your gift will be more courageous because your faith has grasped his promises of help and protection and everlasting I'm for you so that there's an unusual boldness on your witness in the neighborhood or your whatever the gift happens to be. There's an unusual boldness that day because in proportion to your faith which has lay hold on the sweet promises, I'll be with you. I'll help you today. And you feel it like you've never felt it before because it's more clear than you've ever felt it. Now exercise your gift in proportion to that. I think that must have something to do with old John Bunyan's answer to the question, when do you stay in jail and when do you get out? When do you stay in a life-threatening missionary situation, and when do you leave? And there are no clear answers to that. In proportion to your faith, he said. It's not necessarily sin to leave. Paul fled in a basket one time out of Damascus, and it's not necessarily wrong to stay and risk you and your family's life either. Fourth, as your faith increases, you will trust Christ's constancy and faithfulness more, and therefore the exercise of your gift will become more durable, more rugged, more constant. It won't have the kind of flip-floppy up and downs. And here's a guy who one day he just seems incredibly helpful to talk to, and the next day he's just been a total dump and needs us to minister to him. That kind of life will just be evened out if faith becomes more aware and more satisfied by the constancy and faithfulness of Christ. 
Fifth, as your faith increases, you will see and savor more of Christ's mercy and more of your own unworthiness so that the performance of your gift will be done with more lowliness and more meekness because you just tasted sitting in the pew or, or wherever, I am so unworthy. And he is so sufficient. That will create a flavor on the exercise of the gift that may not be there because that sweetness is not tasted at other times in the same measure. Lastly, as your faith increases, you will see and savor Christ's all-satisfying greatness more fully so that the exercise of your gift will be with more joy because he's just clearer today. My faith has enlarged and expanded and has gotten its arms around more of Christ's greatness so that there is a joy rising so that the exercise of my gifts now can be in proportion to that and there's no point in faking it. So my concluding word of summary here, maybe I should just go ahead and summarize the whole message, but, but on that point, give yourself not to building facades, but to building faith. People put a lot of energy into facade, face, figure, strength, or spiritual, pray, pray loud and long. At Bethlehem, they use a lot of Scripture, so I'll use a lot of Scripture in my prayer. It's, don't waste that energy. <laughs> don't waste that energy on building a life of facades. Use that energy to go after faith so that what comes out can be in true proportion to the faith you have, and no more, no less, just real. That's what we want to be. So let me summarize the whole thing. The fourth answer to the question from two weeks ago, why do you make faith the measure, Paul, of my being and my value and now my giftedness? Answer, because faith is the root of all spiritual gifts, and it's the trait that makes natural abilities turn into spiritual gifts, and therefore it is crucial that it become the criteria by which you assess yourself in that way, in those things. And then we saw in verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, and so gifts are a channeling of grace to other people. We saw verse 3, by the grace given to me, I speak, and so Paul is modeling the receiving of grace and the bending it out through his gift of apostleship. And finally, second half of verse 6, we saw, let's use our gifts like prophecy in proportion to our faith, which means now at Bethlehem, Pray for faith. Don't build facades. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we need more faith, more faith all the time. None of us has as much as we could have, and I pray that it would grow. We're commanded, grow in the knowledge and grace of God. Grow in faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So all these TBI classes are great opportunities to grow in faith and thus in more effective giftedness with more grace, more varied, rich, deep, life-changing grace flowing through us to other people. That's what we're made for, to so enjoy you in your fullness that it flows to others for their enjoyment of you as well. So come, I pray, and grant us more faith, even as we visit these ministry fair booths. In Jesus' name, amen.